Okay, folks, uh, we'll start here in just a minute. Uh, if you have your cell phones, uh, you might want to silence them. No, but it, <laughs> I tried to keep her out, folks, but I, I was unable. Okay, well, good morning and uh, congratulations. Uh, you made the uh, adjustment that we mentioned Saturday evening. Um, in short, I'm going to be going to Denver uh, this week, and I'll, I'm planning to be in St. Louis next week. So we move both of the Thursday studies to Monday. So that's, that's why I did it. I mean, I didn't want to cancel, but since the choir is taking a recess, this spot opened up. And uh, so thank you. So we'll do two Mondays and then we'll be back on Thursday schedule. And so if you're following us on live stream, congratulations, you found us at the right place at the right time. Uh, and welcome. Our passage today is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19. So if you're live streaming and want to be following in your Bibles, uh, Matthew 19 is what you would want before you. Those of you that are here have the handout, and that's the text that, uh, that you have. But it's good to be with you. It was a big, busy weekend. <sighs> Kentucky Derby and Cinco de Mayo and uh, uh, Mother's Day and teas and all kinds of stuff. Um, Wow, worship service Saturday night. Um, so congratulations, you, you survived the weekend and uh, hopefully it was a celebration for, for you and uh, lots to be thankful for. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can come together this morning and look into your word and we thank you for the um, truth that is um, inherent there. We pray that you would speak to our hearts and to our minds as we study your word together, um, direct us by your spirit into your truth and encourage us by it. Father, we all have our needs today, concerns today. We pray again for Ukraine and for that situation there that you would be pleased to rule and overrule there and bring peace and an end to hostilities. Father, we thank you for the personal blessings of the weekend and the family celebrations and even though sometimes that can be hard for some, we know that you are, your grace is sufficient and your comfort is real. Bless us now in our study of your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we decided, excuse me, I decided that we would do a study of questions in the scriptures. Uh, I come back to this from time to time because I'm, I'm so attuned to questions and I find interesting questions and want to kind of study the context and the situations that we find them. So we've done, uh, who do you say that I am? And we've done, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And I wanted to come back uh, today to a question that's found in Matthew chapter 19. I, I would introduce the, the question, however, by reminding us all that uh, Questions similar to what we're going to study are found in other places. Uh, if you remember the day, of Act, uh, the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches a stirring sermon about the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. And at the end of Acts chapter 2, uh, the people, uh, I, I want to read it because it's so, it's so interesting. Uh, 
The people respond to Peter's sermon. I wish they had responded to my sermons like this, but uh, anyway, it says, Now when they heard that they were when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? It was like, okay, okay, okay. We get it, we get it. What shall we do in response to this? And then there's another place where a similar degree of urgency is expressed in Acts chapter 16. Uh, Paul and Silas have been in prison and you know the story about them praying and singing hymns to God and an earthquake shakes the foundations of the prison and eventually uh, Paul and Silas are freed and the, the person who is most uh, worked up about this is the jailer uh, who knows that his life is endangered because the prisoners have been set free and he, and he says to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And that allows Paul, or allows Paul to answer that question, and we'll talk about his answer in a moment. But so you have those two situations where you have a question raised about how should we respond to the things of the gospel? What must I do to be saved? And so now in, in Matthew chapter 19, you have this young man uh, coming to Jesus with his question. And the passage begins at verse 16. Behold... A man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? What good deed must I do to have eternal life? And that's the question I want to deal with this morning. A lot of times the questions that Jesus receives are, are spoken with some degree of malice. Uh, the Pharisees or the Sadducees are looking for a way to accuse him, uh, to, uh, to cause him grief. And so they ask him a question to put him on the spot, hoping that he will give an answer that they can use against him in a court of law. But this question doesn't seem to have that same spirit. This question seems to come from a more sincere heart uh, the, the questioner is described in verse 16 as a man. But if you go down to verse 20, uh, it's, he, he is described as a young man. And furthermore, if you go to verse 22, it says the young man had great possessions. So this is what we're told about this individual. He's a rich, young man. And we are not to... Uh, think lowly of him because of that. Uh, that's just who he was and where he was in life. He had obviously been blessed. He's, he's a young man. He's still got his youth and vitality, uh, but he's also got resources. He was a man of means, perhaps a man of influence. I would guess that he probably was a young man with a busy schedule. You know how they are. They've got things to do and people to see and places to go and uh, I kind of picture, I don't have any proof of this, but I picture this situation uh, happening maybe on his lunch break, you know? He, he's, he's got 45 minutes for a lunch break and he seizes the opportunity to, to go and, and, and engage the good teacher and to ask a question he needs answered. And he needs it answered quickly, you know? It's a simple question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Give me my answer, let me check that off my to-do list, and then I'll get back to work. Uh, but it is a very profound question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, let's just think again a little bit more about this situation. Imagine you were one of the disciples. You know, you watch a lot of what Jesus does and how he deals with people. And you're, you marvel at what he says and how he responds and what he is able to do by his miraculous powers. And so as one of his disciples, you hear this young man ask this question, what good deed must I do to get eternal life? What are you thinking? This is going to be good. 
this is really going to be good because here is, <laughs> here is a prospect who comes to Jesus with the question, and here he is. I mean, Jesus, this, this man is going to be putty in Jesus' hands. Jesus is going to witness to this man and draw him ever so kindly and lovingly into the kingdom of God. If I had been a disciple, that's what I would have thought. I thought, this, I'm going to get my phone out. I'm going to video this because this is going to become the ultimate example of what you say and how you bring someone into the kingdom, right? Now, imagine how Jesus must have reacted when he heard the question. What, what thoughts go through his minds as this rich young man comes before him and says, what good deed must I do to get eternal life? Well, typically Jesus hears the question but looks through the question to the heart. And he perceives the condition of the man's heart. He knows what the man says he wants, but Jesus is also thinking about what the man really needs. And he probably understood where this man was confused and why he might have asked his question that way. What good deed must I do to get eternal life? Now, that's speculation, both on the part of what Jesus thought and what the disciples thought, but it helps me kind of <laughs> enter into the situation. On the positive side, the young man seemed to know that eternal life was something he didn't have automatically. Okay, let's give him credit for that. He said, what good deed must I do to get eternal life? Because, see, a lot of folks perceive, assume that eternal life is just something that they have by birthright, uh, that it's just, it's, it's their possession. And he's saying, no, it's not my possession. I, 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 I want to know what I have to do. Uh, on the positive side, there, there was something that was required to receive it, and he he, he needed to know what that was. And he was willing, it seems, it appears to be willing to do whatever was required of him, within limits, of course. I mean, he, he's, he, he's coming with an attitude of, you, all, all you have to do is tell me. Of course, on the negative side, he seemed to be persuaded that eternal life was going to be granted to him on the basis of something that he could do or that he would do. What good deed must I do to get eternal life? Uh, there must be a, a good deed that I must of necessity do that will result in my receiving this idea of eternal life. But, I mean, we can understand that he might have, ra you know, rationalized it that way and thought it through that way. So what does Jesus say in response? Does he say, young man, there's nothing really you need to do because everybody goes to heaven? No, he didn't say that. Did Jesus say, well, I assume you were baptized. Isn't that enough? No, he didn't say that either. And he didn't say, just do your best. Try to be kind. That's about all that God requires. He didn't say that either. Jesus didn't say any of those things. What he said, if I could in my words put it this way, you must repent of your sin and believe on me to have eternal life. I'll get to that in just a moment. The text, if we go back to our text, Jesus first engages the man on the subject of goodness. The question is in verse 16, what good deed must I do? Verse 17, Jesus said to him, why do you ask me about good? Jesus kind of takes this idea of a good thing 
and says, you, you, you're, you're talking about goodness, but I don't know that you really understand it because there is only one who's good. There's only one who's good, and if you would enter life, keep his commandments. He's saying to the man that God, goodness is a quality of God. Ultimate goodness is a quality of God, a characteristic of God. And God's commandments define what God values and what God considers good. And Jesus says, you shall not murder, not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. You'll, you'll love your neighbor as yourself. You'll recognize that as, as the essence of the Ten Commandments. I think what Jesus was doing was trying to help the man to see that he wasn't good, but the man thought he was. Verse 20, the young man said to him, All these I have kept. Now, we might applaud him for such an answer, but Jesus didn't. Jesus grieved that answer because the man had a sense of his own self-righteousness. All these I have kept. Really? You've never lusted in your heart? You've never been angry without a cause you've never taken what doesn't belong to you you've always honored your father and your mother you've loved your neighbor as yourself you've loved God with your whole heart soul mind and strength who can say all these things I've kept there's none righteous no not one this young man had a problem he either redefined the ten commandments or he exalted his own righteousness before the law. And so Jesus, sensing that, speaks to him in words that ultimately are a call to repentance and faith. Now, I say repentance and faith, and neither of those words is in the text. You won't find them there. But let me explain why I think they're there. What's he say in verse 21? Jesus says, if you would be perfect, if you would want this eternal life, go sell what you possess and give to the poor. Jesus knew that the man had an idol in his heart. He loved his riches, and his riches governed his thinking, his goals, his lifestyle, and Jesus understood that a man with an idol in his heart does not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus wanted to bring the man to the confession of his idolatry and to repentance from that idolatry. Now, obviously, it is not sinful to be rich. It is sinful to be consumed by one's riches, defined by one's riches, and to trust in those riches. The love of money is the root of all evil. That's why Jesus says down in verse 23, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And I think you can, that's not just speaking about financial riches. It could be your own success, your, your own wisdom, your intelligence, uh, your performance, your vocation. If, if you trust and rest, if you find your joy, your security, your confidence, your significance, your identity in what you do, what you have, and not in fearing God and trusting Him, then you are a person of riches who will find it difficult to enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus is trying, I think, to break down the man's idolatry of heart and help him to see what he's really trusting because you can't trust Jesus if you're already trusting something else. So repentance 
is required, but also faith is demanded. And faith is found in verse 21 in the simple words, Come, follow me. Go sell and give. Then come, follow me. Jesus understood that genuine salvation involved believing on him for forgiveness. That belief would be evidenced by a new lifestyle of following, trusting, serving, and loving him. Back a couple of chapters in chapter 16, Jesus had proclaimed, If any man would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. The call of Jesus to his disciples was, Come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. The call of the gospel is not simply to pray a prayer or make a decision, but to trust Christ and become a disciple, a follower of the Lord Jesus. So what Jesus is doing in his response in, verses 20, in verse 21, go sell and give, come follow is he's calling the man to repent of his idolatry and to believe fully in Jesus as his Savior and Lord. So, does this story have a happy ending? I wish it did. I wish the rich young man had understood and fallen on his knees before Jesus and with tears in his eyes acknowledged his sin and embraced the Savior but unfortunately, that's not how the story ends. Verse 22, when the young man heard this, in other words, he heard Jesus' response, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He was right on the doorstep of heaven, you might say, but he turned away. He heard the words of Jesus, but must have thought, I can't do that, or I won't do that. He had wanted to settle the issue of eternal life, but he wasn't willing to abide by the Lord's conditions. He wanted it to be based on his performance. What good thing must I do? Perhaps he wanted to be proud of his own achievement. And Jesus said eternal life is a gift given to the humble, not a reward to the proud. It's a given to those who can't or don't deserve it. And that's why it's called grace. This dialogue is so powerful that it produces a second question in our text that is asked now by the disciples, verse 25. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? In other words, the disciples had witnessed this. They had heard the exchange between Jesus and the young man, and then they had heard Jesus kind of summary statement about how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God that they kind of threw up their arms and thought, well, who can be saved? If this man is not willing to be saved, if the rich have an especially difficult path to salvation, then perhaps, perhaps no one can be saved. But notice what Jesus says in verse 26. He looked at, at them and said, with man this is impossible but with God all things are possible. God can take the truth of the gospel and touch hearts so that we are willing to give away what is precious to us in order to receive what is eternal. Maybe this story can have a happy ending, not so much in the young man's situation, but maybe it awakens us to ask a similar type question. Maybe we can learn from the question in Jesus' answer what God really requires for eternal life. It's certainly not our performance. It's not our good work. It's a recognition of our sin, not our goodness, an admission of our emptiness, not our fullness. I go back to the questions I mentioned at the beginning. On the day of Pentecost, the people heard Peter preach and they cried out. I'll read it again to you. 
When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? That's the question. Peter answered them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent. Turn from your sins. And as an act of faith, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In Acts chapter 16, where the Philippian jailer comes to Paul, he says, what must I do to be saved? This is what they said. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your house. And that becomes the consistent message of the book of Acts. Uh, There's a place in Acts chapter 20 where Paul is leaving Ephesus. He gathers the leaders of Ephesus together And he describes his ministry, and he says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not always said exactly the same way. You you notice Acts 2 is a little different than Acts 16. Acts 16 is a little different from Acts 20. But the the ingredients... If when you take them all together and, 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 and say, well, what is the answer to the question? It appears to be there must be a turning from self in repentance, an acknowledgement of sin, and then a reception by faith of the work of Jesus in order for one to be saved. And I would just mention that this is, is what I think I understand this to be saying, and I trust that it's clear to you. When it comes to questions, I'm reminded of uh, Sunday nights that in years past when our family would get back from church and we'd gather around the television and we'd watch that show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Did y'all used to watch that? These contestants had to answer about 10 to 15 questions, I think, in order to, the questions got harder, you know, but uh, they tried to become a millionaire by answering all the questions correctly, but the, the host, Regis, uh, would always say, is that your final answer? He wanted to pin them down to say, you know, are you committed to that answer? And they'd say, it's my final answer. And he'd reveal whether it was right or wrong. Uh, but the question, is that your final answer? That, that's what we ought to be asking ourselves. What's our final answer? What must I do to be saved? What's my answer to that question? That is such an important question that none of us should go through life without a definitive response. And that's why the young man asked it, and I applaud him for asking the question. He might have had, he might have been a little confused, but he seems to have had a sincere interest in knowing the answer to that question. What must I do to have eternal life? Now, he thought he was going to hear that he had to do something And Jesus is basically going to tell him, it's not what you have to do, my friend, it's what I'm about to do that makes all the difference. And you turn from your sin and you rest in me, and you'll be just right. You'll be fine. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this encounter Jesus has with the the rich young man. Thank you that uh, he asked a very vital question that all of us uh, must ask ask and answer at some point. Uh, Thank you that Jesus uh, leads him uh, in in a consideration of his own heart. He does not just make it easy uh, and act as if the heart, a sinful, unbelieving heart, can can have eternal life. Jesus uh, tempted to, to go to the man's heart and show him where he needed to turn from sin and trust in Christ. Fortunately, he wasn't at this point willing to do it. Maybe later he did. But we pray, Father, that as we look at this and as we consider our own hearts, that we would be confident that we have uh, rested and trusted in Christ alone for our salvation and that we can answer that question with confidence that we have believed on the Lord Jesus and thus we have the hope of eternal life. Continue to do that work in our hearts, Father. 
with man it's impossible, but we know that you can do that work in our hearts to give us assurance. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, next Monday, same time, 11 o'clock right here, we'll look at another of the questions in the Bible.